What is up, everybody? Happy Tuesday. Welcome back to another episode of Benzinga Live. I'm your host, Aaron Bree, with my wonderful co-host, Spencer. Where is he? Well, we'll get Spencer soon, but in the meantime, let me just give you a rundown for today. So joining us in a few minutes, uh, we have Trade Shift. Christian Lang, will, who's the CEO, will be joining us live. Um, after that, we've got Yapit Data, co-founder and CEO of Vinicius Vacanti. So excited for that one as well. We're going to be talking some alternative data. Robert Roy from Wealth Builders HQ at 1245. And then Tim Quast at Mark, uh, from Market Structure Edge at 1.30 to discuss market sentiment. Uh, so perfect day to get Tim on before this FOMC meeting tomorrow. Uh, before we get started, let's just take a look at the overall market. Um, it, it seems to me like a lot of investors are just kind of on the sidelines right now, hoarding up cash before this big meeting from the Fed tomorrow. Um, I think once we get that, we'll see a lot more conviction either way, whether it's down or up. We will know more tomorrow after Jerome Powell speaks. Um, let me see what's going on in the chat. Hey, Zoltan, how's it going? Let's go. All right, getting my screen share pulled up. So we can see here that the S&P is down more than uh, about 1.3% again. It, it just seems like everyone's just kind of waiting out, hanging out until we have this meeting tomorrow. Um, so, so until then, we're going to talk about some ways we can play th this meeting tomorrow. Uh, but without further ado, let's go ahead and play the intro, get the show started, and, and Spencer will be joining us. Here. There we go. Let's get those air horns going. Uh, let me know in the chat what you guys are watching today. Any tickers? How are you playing them? Calls, puts, into the FOMC meeting tomorrow. Um, let's go. Let's hit it, Rohan. This is Ben Zinga Live. Spencer Israel and producer AB. What's up, everybody? How are we doing? I'm Someone told me buy high, sell higher. So. Let's get Matt Hammond on the show to talk some IPOs. Jake Wujasek from Trend Spider. We have a. All right, guys. Let me see in the chat what everyone is trading today, what everyone is watching. I don't care if it's a stock. I don't care if it's crypto. Um, I'm just trying to get some action out there because right now I I'm like a lot of other investors out there, a lot of cash, um, just not a lot of conviction on saying, okay, is Powell going to come out and give good news and everything rips like we've seen in the past when Powell speaks? Or is he going to come out and say, hey, we're actually going to, the Fed's going to increase rates. And of course, if they announce that, if they announce an increase in, in rates, that will be bearish for the market in the short term. It's not to say that in that environment that stocks can't still move higher. But um, I, I suspect that if we do see a rate hike, that we'll see especially a lot of, of big tech growth stocks get hit. So your Amazons, your Apples, um, all, all those stocks, it seems like people are, are very much risk off right now ahead of this meeting. Um, in some other headlines, something that I found interesting last night, um, let me go ahead and get it pulled up on my screen so you guys can see it. Um, a senator, John Hickenlooper, he's a Democrat from Colorado, Disclosed Friday night, uh, this person that posted it on Twitter, it's Congress trading. They just track trades from congressmen. Um, saying he reported this late Friday night to avoid the news cycle, he sold up to $4 million worth of stocks ahead of this FOMC meeting on Wednesday. So if we zoom in and look at the individual names, they're essentially all big name tech stocks, right? PayPal, NVIDIA, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, or, or Meta platforms whichever you want to call it, Apple, Amazon, Google, the trade desk. So he sold a lot of these stocks. You can see in this column the amount. It looks like NVIDIA was his biggest position, sold somewhere between half a million and a million dollars. Um, so we just found that interesting. Well, we, we have an article coming out on this on Benzinga.com about this sale. Um, so it's always interesting to see kind of what elected officials are doing with their trades. Of course, we, we've talked a lot about uh, Nancy Pelosi's trades in the in the past and, and a few others. So uh, something to just keep an eye on. I mean, it, it's easy to see this and say, oh, my God, he, he knows something um, that's going to come out in the Fed meeting tomorrow. And that's why he sold all these big tech stock names. Maybe, maybe not, though. Maybe he just needed to free up some cash for tax purposes or, or whatever it is. Um, 
But all right, guys. So we've got Christian Lang joining us. He is the Trade Shift CEO. Uh, Trade Shift's a very interesting company, kind of combining software as a service and, and fintech platforms, connecting a, a lot of um, the world supply chain. So a very good time to get Christian on and talk about the supply chain and, and all the issues kind of going on there. So as soon as I, I get a sign from him, maybe a thumbs up that he's ready to come on, we'll go ahead and bring Christian on. All right, I got it. Let's do it. Without further ado, we're going to play our little intro and bring Christian on the show. Hey, Christian, how's it going? Hey, man, hey, Aaron. Great to meet you. How? Yeah, so it's great to get you on the show. Thank you for taking time out of your, out of your busy Tuesday to join us. Um, so before we get started, just for some of our investors, uh, our audience out there that may not be familiar, can you just give us a background, quick elevator pitch on TradeShift? Yeah, so it's, it's pretty simple what we do and, and also at the same time extremely complex. Uh, whenever a large company around the world, Fortune 500 typically, they trade with their suppliers in the supply chain. They have typically hundreds of thousands of suppliers all over the world. Um, they use our cloud software to do it, right? So think about invoices, purchase orders, uh, logistics around it. Um, our software takes care of all of that, takes care of payments, tax compliance, uh, even insurance and, and early payment and so on. So that's what we do. And as a you know, a part of doing that, we obviously see a very, very huge chunk of, of world trade. We move more than a, a, a half a trillion dollars a year in, in trade, right? So a huge number. Um, and yeah, we sit in the smack middle of, of everything that's happening right now in supply chains as well. So so what do you see kind of going on in the supply chain world? I mean, if, if you want to back up, say, like six months ago or, or maybe even longer than that, kind of at the height of this supply chain disruption that we've seen, have we seen any of that uh, alleviated? You know, I, I see some headlines saying it looks like the supply chain issue in regards to semiconductors is being lightened. Is that true? Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, um, the supply chain issues we have today uh, is not a, just a, from COVID. They, they stretch us back 10, 20 years sometimes even. Supply chains are very slow beasts to move. You can take an example in the UK, right? We had Brexit. We knew four years ago Brexit would come, yet we have UK supermarkets that don't have inventory. They had four years to plan, right? So um, if you take semiconductors, it's the same. Uh, seven years ago, Toyota, they started stocking up on inventory of semiconductors. That should have been an, a warning signal to the whole auto industry. I mean, Toyota, they invented just-in-time production. There was the guy that says, have no inventory. And when those guys start buying up semiconductors seven years ago, um, they, they knew what was coming, right? So I think a lot of people are acting really, really surprised right now and saying, well, COVID did it. But the reality is that the, the supply chain system we have is incredibly fragile. It's, it's sort of glued together with this idea that there can be no disruption. The world will just work as we know it. Um, and if there's any disruption, you know, um, the wheels will fall off pretty rapidly. So uh, I'll give you an example on semiconductors, right? The, the, the Biden administration are talking about putting 50 billion aside for what they call the, the chip bill to, to build, uh, uh, you know, manufacturing plants for, for semiconductors in the U.S. Uh, 50 billion is roughly uh, four, four fabs. Um, and those fabs will be outdated in three years. Right? Got it. So... Wait. <laughs> so you know, we, we, are, we are far, far away from getting back to normal on any of these, um, I would say, uh, issues. So I just want to back up for a second. I, I like to do this sometimes, kind of back up, make sure I'm understanding everything correctly. I'm kind of the slow down guy. But um, you said that Toyota was, uh, they stopped buying semiconductors years Start, ago? They started stocking up on semiconductors, okay. right? So they, they increased the inventory dramatically on, on semiconductors and buying up vertically integrating, getting manufacturing aligned. Um, and Toyota invented just in time, which means they don't want to have inventory normally, right? So when those guys buy inventory and start stocking up on stuff, uh, you should pay attention. So this was that was before, you know, obviously we knew anything with, that with COVID-19 or that a pandemic would disrupt the global supply chain? Yeah, I, I think, look, this is going to be a little bit controversial. I think a lot of sort of, uh, you know, especially in the car industry, but everywhere else, people have been asleep at the wheel, right? They're assuming that the business as usual will continue. Um, and um, I mean, in the auto industry, we've known for five, seven years that there will be issues around semiconductors. It's, it's not a new thing. It's just um, COVID really, really 
sort of broke the system uh, because we stopped buying. I mean, a lot of large companies stopped buying everywhere, and then suddenly they started buying again, right? We saw the largest spike in purchase orders we've ever seen in the second quarter of this year, but there's no invoices coming because people are not able to produce it. They're not able to deliver it, right? So there's a big disconnect between what the companies now want to do and what they can get because they stopped during COVID. Yes. So, and, and the way I see it, I mean, in, within the supply chain, we you have a few different issues, right? You have the issues from the actual suppliers, whether they're they're having trouble finding the raw materials they need or, or producing um, what it is they're producing, and, and then also on the uh, shipping side, you know, we saw this whole disruption w w with shipping containers. The shipping port a a in Long Beach, California, was all blocked up. Is that side of the thing starting to ease a little bit? Or are we still seeing a lot of um, congestion in, in the shipping component? I mean, the, the shipping component is improving, right? And and that's the um, almost the easiest part of all of this to solve, right? Um, I mean, they're stacking containers twice as high in LA now, uh, mostly thanks to my friend uh, Ryan from Flexport, who just called that issue out, right? Um, and that's kind of no brainer. I mean, the American ports are incredibly inefficient. They're all paper based. Uh, I mean, if you've ever been to China, you would know the ports are completely automated. It's essentially just like one giant robot, right? Um, and then you come to a US port and, and, you know, you still have people standing at the docks with like clipboards writing down what's in each container, right? So there are definitely a massive opportunity for improvement uh, on losing sites. So the, the bad news is it's this bad. The good news is those things can be fixed fairly easy, but increasing demand uh, like production, so, so supply of semiconductors, that's much harder or increasing raw material inventory is much, much harder because people are not going to start mining more copper just because there's a crunch right now because they don't want to drop the prices later, right? Yeah, and I, I actually, you know, I was following that thread from Ryan from Flexport on Twitter in real time while he was... Uh, you know, he just went on a ride essentially in a boat around the, the port and was tweeting what he saw. And he said like, hey, they're, they're not stacking the, the uh, containers. They have this ordinance against it. And then next thing you know, you know, uh, I think it was the LA Times or, or some uh, newspaper in LA reported on what he was saying. And the next day they changed it. So it was incredible to see kind of the influence he had there and just pointing out a problem that he saw. And the next thing you know, it was fixed. Yeah, no, I, th I think, but I think you also got to understand that the rest of the world are light years ahead when it comes to the infrastructure of, for instance, their ports, right? And in the U.S., we, we, we haven't invested in that infrastructure. We haven't invested in modern, modernizing that infrastructure. And, and that's one of the massive challenges is all like it's all paper based and, and huge chunks of supply chains are still paper based, um, which will surprise you. Like in 2021, I mean, we still have, you know, we get into customers and we see they're still using fax sometimes right this is like uh, from way before you and i was born um and it's still a primary technology to deliver a message that you got to produce this um so i think you know um but i think the much bigger issue is actually that a lot of buyers a lot of the big companies right now they want resilience right they want to be able to deliver to the consumers uh at a steady clip and, and not have these issues so what they're doing is they're asking the suppliers to increase inventory but at the same time they're telling suppliers we're going to pay you later Right. So they're, they're delaying the payment dates, moving it out to be even later. And then they're telling suppliers to increase the inventory. And that is hitting economically uh, vast amounts of especially the mid sized and smaller suppliers all over the world. Um, and I think um, what we're going to see in, in 2022 is, is a redo of this whole supply chain issue. But it's going to come from the financial side. It's not going to come from the inventory side. It's going to be that suppliers can't afford to build or invest in capacity. They can't afford to buy more inventory. And unless that that knot gets uh, untied, that there's a bigger, bigger issue there waiting for us. Yeah, and, and I mean, you know, just like you said, there these big companies they want resilience. Anytime we see uh, any sort of downtrend, whether it's something like from COVID or or whatnot, what you see is the the strong companies remain resilient and actually get stronger. Um, and it kind of weeds out some of these these weaker companies that maybe were, weren't in a great position heading into um, whatever tough time it is, whether it's the COVID-19 crash. Um, all right, Christian, so let's, let's talk more about trade shift. What What is it that you guys are doing differently than other companies in your space? So I think um, if you think about most supply chains, right, they, they're really just uh, – you know, multi-tier, right? You have a large buyer buying from a, you know, aggregator, a supplier, and then they're buying from smaller suppliers and so on. 
the way that these processes have been linked in the past is essentially that every single link don't know what happens one step above them or below them, right? It's essentially, oh, we're just doing our business and selling to this guy. The way we build trade shift, this is a network. So everybody is connected. You can pass information all the way through the supply chain from the smallest supplier up to the big guy. That also means that if you're a huge, you know, Fortune 500 company, you can know ahead of time if you have issues five to five levels down in the supply chain. So by making it all digital, by making it all connected, um, and by making all of the transactions digital, we can, one, get people paid much faster, we can get a lot more transparency, and we can get a lot more data um, to, to the big guys on and small guys on what's happening in the supply chain. Um, but we can also build digital products around this, right? So if you're a supplier and you're sending an invoice and, and your big customer is telling you you're going to be paid in 90 days, well, we can pay you immediately because we have all of the data proving uh, that you're you know, a good uh, supplier and you're going to get paid, right? So. So it's really a revolution in two areas. One is digitizing everything, but then using all of that data to build better services, better products, better payments, um, better lending, and so on. Yeah, so I mean, it sounds like there's a lot of things going on between the uh, kind of cloud data computing in, in the supply chain uh, industry, which, which we've seen just so much news coverage of. I mean, it, was this shocking to you? Like you, you would have never expected to see supply chain be in the headlines every day for the last six months or so? You know, it's funny, right? I mean, COVID taught everybody about supply chain. And I mean, for us, I mean, I, I, you know, it's COVID is a, a horrible event. And obviously, the, 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 the human toll has been incredible. But for trade shift, I think what we've been saying for 10 years, which is you need to digitize your supply chain, you need to make yourself resilient, you need to be able to have capacity, all of these things. Suddenly, people listened. And, and that's been amazing. And I think as a, as a company, the model that we have offered, uh, which is to say, you got to have all of your operations digital, it has gotten a lot of momentum through this period of time, right? And, and so trade shift, we've been incredibly lucky, I think, in, in our timing. Um, I think, you know, there's still a long way to go for the world supply chains to, to, to really, you know, uh, accelerate. And I think um, we see right now a lot of people talking about, for instance, like, okay, blockchain is going to come solve all of this, you know, overnight. Um, I, I think what most people don't get is that supply chains are social systems, right? They are people. Um, and uh, it's very messy. Um, so, so we really need very resilient, very flexible digital solutions to, to do that. It's incredibly complex, but the timing has been very good. Got it. And, and then I also wanted to just ask you about, um, are there any plans for TradeShift to go public at some point if some of our audience was interested in investing in TradeShift? Um, we, we are definitely not uh, discounting that opportunity, I would say. Um, we, we are watching, I think you, you're just describing uh, the meeting tomorrow as well and the market. We, did, we are watching the markets like everybody else, right? I mean, our goal, uh, and you know, we have a size and scale today where we can be a public company if we choose so. So it's more a matter of, of, of timing and how we see the market. Uh, right now, we are, we are happy to be private, but, but we have that option. And I think, you know, um, the, the interesting piece is that the space we're in is very resilient uh, to to uh, essentially both recession and, and growth, right? I mean, if if, uh, if companies need to save money, our technology help them do that. If they need to grow faster, they need to, our technology help them do that. And um, and the supply chain is, is an area that's not going to have less focus the next 10 years. So uh, we're definitely thinking about continuing our story in the public market, right? Got it. Um, all right, Christian, well, thank you for joining us today on Benzinga Live. I look forward to, uh, you know, reaching back out to you and getting you back on anytime we have anything in the supply chain world that we need to talk about. Uh, now we have an expert. We've got a guy that we can bring on. So we appreciate it, Christian. Thank you so much. Have a good day. You do the same. All right, y'all. That was Christian Lang, the CEO of TradeShift. Um, you know, check that company out if you're looking to learn more about the supply chain in general and, and how companies are kind of moving more digital on that. All right, coming up now. Oh, look who it is. Oh, hello there. Oh, no, is my mic not on? Oh, no. Wait. One second. Uh-oh. Our, 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 our producers have, have failed us. Sp Spencer is... <laughs> Spencer's going to try to figure out uh, what he did to his mic. I'm not very That's sure. Very nice. Um, all right. But coming up in a couple minutes, we're going to bring on uh, th the Yip It Data, co-founder and CEO of Vinicius Vacanti. Hope I'm saying that name right. I'll bring him on and ask him. Um, 
So we'll be talking some some data, some alternative data there. Other than that, let me know what you guys are watching. Real quick before we bring Venetius on, I do want to do a quick crypto update. Uh, not a great day for, for crypto again outside of our old favorite. Mr. Dogecoin having a great day. Dogecoin up back. nearly 20%. This is, of course, on news that Elon Musk said that he is going to put Tesla merchandise out with the option to buy it with Dogecoin. So as you can see, Dogecoin is just killing the rest of the crypto market. Can you um, hear me? I can hear you. Okay, good. I'm back. Sorry, everyone. That was, that was, Very nice. That was user error. You are fake news. I am not. Damn, damn son. Where'd you find this? Uh, yeah, I got, we got a new soundboard, so I'm having some fun with it. Um, but all right, yeah, like I said, so Dogecoin up on that Elon Musk. Tesla news, everything else pretty mixed. I mean, you've got Bitcoin and Ethereum down uh, about a percent each, so not really big moves for either of the two main coins. Cardano down a little bit. Uh, you've got Luna, which is Terra. I, I still don't know what Luna is. It's Terra. It is Terra? Okay. Can I just say about Dogecoin real fast? Do you know what the high of the day was? Maybe? No clue. It's twenty two cents. So it's gone down. Three. It's been, it, and and it hit that high pretty much in the first like half hour uh, so, after that news came out. Yeah, and that was at like six a.m. this morning. Interesting. So there's that. All I don't, right. I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Um, well, if you're interested, uh, you're if you're not in crypto and you want to get into crypto. Oh. Whoa. What was that? I played the video instead of the the bumper. <laughs> 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 uh, we have this code. Uh, Sign up using the code Zing Z I N G to get fifty dollars free in Bitcoin after you deposit a hundred dollars and make your first trade on Voyager. So, like I said, if you're not in crypto, looking to get in, this is a great way to do it. Fifty dollars in free Bitcoin. Um, turn a hundred dollars into a hundred and fifty dollars worth of Bitcoin. Pretty good deal there. All right, that's enough talking about crypto. Talking about Dogecoin. Talking about Bitcoin. Time to talk some data. Uh, we're going to go ahead and bring Venetius on as soon as I get a little sign from him, maybe a thumbs up that he's ready to come on. Oh, yep, we've got it. All right, let's play our little intro. M maybe turn your uh, volume down a notch before I play this in intro if it's a little loud. <laughs> How's it going, Venetius? Did I did I butcher your name, v Venetius Vacanti? Yeah, you butchered it, but that's okay. Uh, you can just call me Vin. Vin. All right, that's easier. All right, well, this if... is so terrible. <laughs> no, it's a very hard to... name. It's how do we not name. know how to pronounce our guest names? Come on, people. What well, if, if if you were me? How would you have said it? Uh, if I were you, I wouldn't have tried. Uh, but okay. uh, the correct <laughs> pronunciation is uh, Vinicius. Vinicius. Yes. All right. Got it. Well, now I, now I know. Um, all right, Vin. Well, can, right. can you go ahead and give I us a even... quick elevator pitch on, uh, on Yip It Data before we get going? Yeah, of course. So um, there is a lot more data in the world than there used to be. I mean, you think about data on public websites, you think about credit card, email receipt data, et cetera, sort of in the last five years, tremendous growth. If you are an investment fund or if you are a company, this data can be incredibly insightful uh, to you to either make better investments or to make better business decisions as a company. The problem is that the data is raw, it's unstructured, it's large, it constantly changes. And then for every company that you want to analyze, you have to look at the data slightly differently. Now, there are a couple of investment funds and companies out there that have made huge investments in using this data and turning it into insights for themselves. But what about everyone else? And that is where Yipit data comes in. As we go out and collect and analyze all the best data sets that are out there, we ingest them, we clean them, analyze them, and then ultimately for investors, we write reports on the companies that they care about. And then for companies, we cover their spaces. So help them understand market share, customer analytics, et cetera. Got it. So what companies have you guys found some interesting data on recently? Well, we have 72 products, and a product is roughly a company. Sometimes it includes multiple companies. I'll give you an example of how we've been very helpful to our investor clients. So Zillow is a company we have tracked for a long time. And as you may be aware, Zillow had entered into the iBuyer space, which is what Open Door really pioneered. 
which is Zillow was actually going to change their business model to involve actually purchasing homes and selling homes. And so the data that we were collecting uh, in the fall suggested that Zillow was buying way more homes than what market ex expectations were in guidance. However, they weren't actually selling those homes. Um, and so their revenue that they were going to be generating from their iBuyer space was actually dramatically underperforming market expectations. So we let our customers know about that. And then the company announced in their earnings shortly after that they were actually winding down the whole business of buying and selling homes and the stock went down 11%. Now, why did that happen? Because Zillow had tweaked their algorithm and so they were bidding much higher for homes than historical, henceforth buying way more homes than expected, which is what our data said. However, they weren't able to sell those homes at a great price. And so therefore, a lot fewer homes sold. Again, what our data suggested, which is not a good sign, obviously, for the business. And so, you know, the crazy thing is this data is out there. Anyone could have done this analysis. Of course, it takes a tremendous amount of effort uh, to understand both what Zillow is doing, their business model, to be able to compare that to Open Door, et cetera, which is something where we have a dedicated team that covers this iBuyer space was able to do. I, I'm curious, did you run that same analysis on, on Open Door and uh, um, Redfin? Those are the other two that do the eye buying, right? Yeah, uh, so we actually so. cover Open Door as well, and our okay. analysis did not suggest the same thing was happening to Open Door. And so it was very so, uniquely happening to Zillow during that time. Interesting. So, Vin, I'm, I'm sure a lot of our audience right now is interested in the product. Is there. Uh, a product from Yipit data for essentially retail investors, or is it more on the institutional side? Yes, I figured you would ask that question. So we do work mainly on the institutional side. And so we work with huge funds, $100 billion funds. We actually do work with a few uh, individual investors, but they typically have positions in these companies in the kind of five plus million dollar range uh, in order to be able to afford uh, our product. So it very much is an enterprise sort of level product. Well, well, maybe you and I can, can speak offline about how we could maybe bring some of this data to, to retail investors, because our whole mission here at Benzinga is to make financial news and data easily consumable and, and democratize it. So to bring it down to the everyday um, investors. So um, if there are any other companies' examples like you, you can give on the, on yeah, the Zillow front. I, I, I have examples because I actually did my research here, Aaron. Uh, like, if you guys never heard of this firm, they, they have the power to move stocks, right? You guys have dropped data on eBay. Uh, you've moved eBay. You've moved Netflix. You know, I think you moved Peloton a couple weeks ago or maybe it was last week as well. Cause you, well tell us what your, what your data said about Peloton. Yeah, so with Peloton, the key metrics that we track for them is obviously what people want to know is, you know, their sales and how they're how are people buying bikes, are people upgrading uh, and also getting the tread product and then the active, you know, riders metric as well. And so we are able to track those metrics. Um, and as a result, um, this is about three months ago, we started to suggest that there may have been some weakness uh, in the business relative to market sort of expectations. And, you know, we issue these reports to our customers. Now, our, our customers take this and they combine it with everything else they know, and then they make trades uh, accordingly. And I think they saw that as a pretty bearish sign uh, and therefore kind of traded down. And then, you know, two months later, the company ultimately reported earnings uh, and it was below kind of expectations and the stock really kind of went down. Um, and so, you know, that is another example, but all the ones you sort of said, what we're doing is really using data to track the key performance indicators of these businesses. Um, and, you know, the data is out there. It's just a tremendous pain to do all of this work yourself. But I think you also reported that we have a headline from you from last week that their Peloton's Black Friday was apparently very strong. Yes. Um, and so, you know, with these businesses, obviously, there are periods where they are weak and there are periods where they are strong. It is we're not investment advisors. We don't say buy, hold, sell. We just tell you what the data is saying. And, you know, at on Black Friday, uh, Peloton sales were strong. Um, interesting. So I, we won't find out for sure how strong. <laughs> bless you. 
we'll until see. the company tells yeah. us uh, in the next earnings report. But um, this is probably uh, something good to, to file away in our back pockets until then. Um, Sounds good. And so our, I, I, I apologize if you already addressed this or maybe if you can't tell us entirely, but where are you getting all of this data from? That's, of course. That's the, secret, that's the secret sauce. Yeah, well, there's lots of different sources of data out there. So, you know, on the public website data side, uh, there's a ton of data that's just available op on the open public web. And so you have to build systems to go out and collect that data every day. Obviously, these websites change all the time, which means you have to constantly change your systems to make sure that you're accurately collecting that data and then you don't mess, you know, miss important uh, changes that happen. There's also a lot of panels of data. So when you think about the Nielsen panel, which is something a lot of people are familiar with, uh, the Nielsen panel uh, is a panel that was created by Nielsen to be able to track mm -hmm. what shows people were watching and they created TV ratings, et cetera. Now, the thing about panels, which is really interesting, is that, for instance, you don't, they don't need to be very big for them to be very accurate. Now, if you think, if you think about the question of what is the average height of an American, you don't actually need to ask every American for their height. You can ask for a very random small percentage of it, and the answer that you will get back will be very close to the actual number. And this is called the law of large numbers. And so the same applies here. And so there's lots of different panels like the Nielsen panel that have been developed, and they're not very large, but they're very accurate. Uh, because of the characteristics involved with them. And so we bring in all different types of data sets and panels to analyze them to provide this kind of market research. A couple of questions from our chat. Um, are there any mm -hmm, are there any up and coming uh, any companies that that are up and coming based on data that that you're seeing that that maybe are is not being appreciated out there? Oh yeah. Uh, there's a lot. I mean, I think the, from, you know, I'll just take a sort of a step back. Um, when you think about all these companies that have been going public recently, uh, so if you think about like uh, Coinbase and Roblox and Toast, these companies didn't come from nowhere. Uh, these were businesses that were privately valued at over a billion dollars, known as the unicorn. Uh, and that and these businesses all kind of were get, got to that level back in 2017. So when you think about the companies that are going IPO that are exciting today, you can kind of there's a leading indicator for that, which is look at how big the sample of companies were back four or five years ago. So the answer to that question is there were 200 plus companies privately valued over a billion dollars four or five years ago. So if you want to know how exciting is the IPO market going to get over the next few years? A leading indicator of that is, well, how many companies today are worth more than a billion dollars? And you, if the number has stayed the same, so it's basically around 200, then you can expect this trend to continue, except the number hasn't stayed the same. There are now almost 1,000 companies worth over a billion dollars in the private markets, which implies that over the next five-year period, there should be a boom relative to current times in terms of all these companies are going to need to go public. As exits for their investors. But then the, the other side of that coin, though, is they go public at a lower valuation, which we haven't seen yet. But just because we haven't seen it doesn't mean it couldn't happen. So. Yeah, but for your audience... You know, if, if they're investing in the public markets, you know, that could be even better. If the companies go public at a lower valuation, it's an opportunity for them to buy in uh, at those companies and, and ride uh, that up. Um, obviously, if you're investing in the private markets, uh, that's not as good. Uh, but regardless, what it means is, look, not all these companies are going to go public, but there's a big amount of excitement coming over the next five years in the public markets. Okay, speaking of IPO, y'all just raised a lot of money in the Series E. Um, what, what are your intentions going forward? Yeah. So, you know, we raised, uh, you know, this large round of funding, uh, from Carlisle group. We're super excited to work with them. The reason we raise this money is the number one complaint from our customers is we don't cover enough companies. Uh, we don't cover enough sectors. And so they just want, they want more product from us. And so the purpose of this funding is really to expand our product portfolio, to cover many more companies, to cover more spaces, to go deeper on existing spaces. So that's what people can sort of expect from us. Now, regards to IPO, et cetera, 
we are now heads down on building the company and growing the business. And so we're not sort of focusing on that at this point. So, so Vin, has there been any talk about trying to create a, a, you know, retail investing type platform, something that more people could have access to this data for, maybe at a lower price point than the uh, institutional investor model? Yeah, no. Well, you know, we started the business very much to democratize access to this because we saw this situation where just a few companies and, and investment funds were basically doing all of this work for themselves. And we recognized that there was an opportunity to help a much broader kind of market. And so that's why we have done what we've done. It's to really help those funds that are three people, 10 people be on the same level playing field as everyone else to kind of democratize access to this data. So it's definitely something that we are, uh, you know, could be an opportunity for us. And we would love to help kind of retail investors with this as well. Obviously, the challenges with that is, you know, the product, the distribution model, it's like a whole different type of business. And one of the main pieces of advice I give to anyone who's trying to grow a business the way we are, is the power of focus. And you need to be focused on bringing, you know, one thing to one person really, really well before you start expanding. All right, uh, Vin Vacanti, the co-founder and the CEO of Yipid Data. Vin, uh, I'm, we're always into uh, learning about alternative data sets and how it can be applied to uh, to the capital market. So we appreciate the time today. Thanks for coming on Benzinga Live. All right, thank you so much, Aaron and Spencer. Have a great day. All right, and next time we will get your name right. I promise. Well, Happy we'll holidays. About too. that. <laughs> all right. Bye. Okay. Fine. All right. All right. All right. All right. Vin, Vin threw down the gauntlet. Challenge accepted. Next time we will have we have him on, we will get his name right. Uh, here, here's a name that, that, I can, that I, can, I can definitely pronounce. Robert Roy. I can do that. Uh, Robert Roy coming out live right now. We're talking options, talking trade ideas, talking setups. Do we have Robert Roy here? I think we do. Mr. Roy? Hey, hey. How are we doing, Spencer? Doing fantastic. How are we doing today? I am wonderful. Aaron looks like his arm is doing well, too, over there. <laughs> well, he's here. He's right there. Hey, Rob. How's it going? I'm good. And yourself? Pretty, pretty good. Well, my options could be better, but I'm, I'm assuming you're going to... Wait, wait, Rob, real fast. I think you might be on the wrong mic setting. Oh, maybe okay. Not. I could, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Am I wrong, do you think? I How do I know if say. I'm on the wrong mic setting? Uh, well, it looks like you've got a nice mic on, but it doesn't sound like you have a nice mic on, so... Uh, if you, if you, it, oh no, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. All right, I could be wrong, Rob. I could be wrong. I apologize if I cause confusion. Nah, it's okay. This is okay, a new headset. Sorry. I'm, I'm trying not to use these little earbuds. They just don't work well for me. Okay, fair. I apologize. That, that, that was my fault. Okay. Um, so can we uh, show your charts here and and walk and see what you're seeing in this market? Yeah, let's go ahead and share that screen okay. and do that. Uh, let me bring a chart up. Okay, so first thing I want to go into is S and P five hundred. So let's have a conversation there first. Yes, please. All right. So <clears throat> what, what do we got? Take that off. All right. So sorry, I'm just trying to get it all set up for us. Yeah. So we've got this, you know, this overall Fibonacci move that was made from way back here in October, seems like a forever ago, up to the high at that point in November, on November 5th. We played games over here where we kept testing that upper level again, and we finally broke out, and that's where we got that big fail that came off, right? In the last week, since I was on with you guys, uh, we've had a tremendous gain to the upside, and today we kind of gave way again, um, breaking down where if you take – today's candle off of the screen we're in a boat what i would call a bullish bias right the eight is above the 21 the 21 is above the 55 it's a true bullish bias our moving averages are starting to spread a little bit between the 8 and 21 uh the 21 to 55 is kind of holding the same spacing and then today we got this collapse down below right and the collapse was pretty clear the open we tried the, the bulls tried to fight and push back again and gave way and, and fell back under the 236 fib line now that Fibonacci level, Fibonacci level, for those of you that don't know, write it down. This is a hesitation level. 236 at 764, 
if you're using 786 is the standard, I use 764. They're both hesitation levels. The 236 is more common. We'll see stocks get to that level more often. So we broke, retested, and dropped. So right now it puts us into what is known as a neutral bias when we look at it from a Fibonacci standpoint. We're in a neutral bias right now with this 4,600 level as our short-term support. But I'm not surprised to see us move and push into that level. So everything we've done in the last couple of weeks since we've had some of this craziness has all gone shifted primarily to day trades. We're doing some longer term, but for my, my regular normal every day is primarily looking at day trades. I'm looking for explosive moves on key stocks. You can see the 20 primary stocks that I trade right here up on the left-hand side. Um, and, and they're all the, the big guys, right? Adobe, Amgen, Amazon, Baba Booking, and so forth. All big companies, you know, people look at it and go, United Healthcare. I think we've made more money on United Healthcare than taking out of effect or consideration the big guns, the Amazons of the world. I think we've made more on United Healthcare than we have on most of the other stocks that we've got in our portfolio. Um, and again, none of them stocks, all options. It's just, they've had great setups in there. That's what it is. It's just when you get, this key setup where your moving average is right at a fib line and you get that bounce and the bounces are meant, my trade setups are meant to be explosive. That's really the bottom line. I'm not looking for it's going to happen in a couple of weeks. We'll buy a month of time, but if I'm not out of my first exit within two to three days on a swing trade, I look at it as something is not going right because our trades are meant to make moves and it's all because of the way confluences and levels lay out that they, they just tend to break from there. So with what's going on with the S&P today, then we've got to look more of the bearish side, right? So Aaron, you said you were in trouble with some of the options. I'm assuming you've got some longer term and some calls on them. Is that what it is? Yep. Wait, longer okay. term? Oh, well, I, wait. Well, it's not just for today. Uh, okay. Are you day trading it or are you, are you holding calls overnight? I'm holding calls overnight. I've got okay. uh uh, Alibaba 130 call that expires the monthlies in January and an Apple call that expires this Friday. Okay. So Alibaba, I've got a bearish bias on before today. We got a little quick pop today. We got above the moving average there. It puts us into a bearish neutral, but nothing in here that is giving me a signal yet of who we should take a, a directional trade on it. Apple, All right, so I should sell. All right. I'm not trying to tell you that, that you should or shouldn't, right? But keep something in mind. No, uh, just, okay. Sell the Baba call. <laughs> well, <laughs> keep, keep something in mind. You may get a pop. I don't know. I don't know what your motivation was for entering into the trade. But you've got to look at this as what is, you know, and it's, I talk about three positions of the chair, right? Position number one is back here. I can't reach the keyboard. I can't place a trade. I'm analyzing what's going on. And I'm looking at the chart and I'm trying to figure out if there's a compelling reason to take a bullish entry on this. I right, like this, this one. I like this position. Uh, the, this one sitting back. Yeah, no, this is good. Position number two would be, so today could become a position number two bullish, short term, right? We got above the moving average. If we close here, I'd be straight up in the air now. That's position two. I could place a trade, but I'm not ready. Position three is tomorrow. We come back and retest that eight moving average and bounce. Now I'm sitting on the edge of the chair and I'm ready to work, right? And I'm, I'm into placing that trade. So it's just, it's just from a mental standpoint, helps me to get a grasp on what I should be looking at in, uh, in the charts, right? So uh, Alibaba, you know, to me, it's bearish. Uh, you said Apple was the other one? Yep. So I like Apple. Um, ironically, I took a bearish trade on it today. Okay. Uh, but I did it for that, do that does not compute. That does not compute. Why doesn't it compute? You said you like Apple. I, I do. All right. Oh, so no, no, no. You see, okay. My, my grandmother, when I was 16, 17 years old, told me, listen, you should go and date a lot of girls right now because once you find the one, if I catch you fooling around, it's all over. Okay? okay. And I don't want to be married to an Apple. I don't want to live just with Apple. I want to look at Apple and say, hey, let's hang out today. And Apple, what did it do? It had this great break yesterday of this upper line, right, that 176.87 level. Today it came back in and retested it. And look at where it bottomed out, right at the moving average today. I mean, it, it gave you an ideal opportunity to take the entry in the trade, to exit the trade. I'm trying to remember. It was about a $2 move. 
I think we we're out by about 1130. It was about a $2 move on the options price there. So I do like Apple, but when I say that, Spencer, I don't mean I like it. Doesn't mean I want to buy the stock. It means I like it that it's in a position that I could take yeah. a trade, whether it's bullish or bearish. Hey, Voodoo, how you doing, my friend? Um, that makes sense, Spencer. It does. It does. Okay. I thought you were going to say your grandma told you when you were sixteen, seventeen to go buy Apple stock, and I was going to oh, say, Oh God, no! <laughs> she was, no, no, she no, was no, no, smart. no. No, 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 no. I don't know if Apple stock was around when I was 16 years old. <laughs> oh, sure that, that, was. That was what? Yeah, sure it was. was. What, 19, 1995? Sure, sure was. Sure yeah, was. something like that. I just don't want to think that far back. I didn't know what the stock market even was when I was 16 years old. I had no clue. Hey, you know, <laughs> that's probably for the best. Now you've got uh, like 14-year-olds on Robin Hood and stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's... I saw a YouTube video one time. I, I click on it. It says, how to trade cryptos with $5. And I go and look, and it's like a 12-year-old kid. I'm like, okay, this is great. <laughs> yeah. uh, we gotta um, get you, we'll have to get you on a stream with young investors sometimes. <laughs> Listen, I teach it. You know, it's funny. The, the CEO of your company, I was on the one time with him, um, Spencer, and he was talking about the nonprofit he does. And I've gone into the schools locally years back and taught to the math classes about the market and made a game out of it for him. Um, and I love to do it again. I just... Um, need to figure out the right method for it. But I think kids, they absorb this so well. I think they do phenomenal with it. If you teach my, one of my most successful students started with me when he was nine and wow, he trades full time right now. He's in his early twenties. It is that's sick. That's it was sick. disgusting. He, you know, his name was Grant and he was, you know, like this tall when he was nine years old. And all of a sudden we're in a live workshop and I ask a question about an advanced spread and you hear this answer from the back of the room this squeaky little voice and I look back. Okay. Yep. You're right. Good. And I ask another one. And again, in two or three times, he answers this question. And then all of a sudden people start turning around and realize it's this nine-year-old answering these advanced options questions. And that was the first training that he was in with me, uh, was that one. And well, we've, he, 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 I was just yeah. gonna say, if you can teach him, then maybe you could teach me <laughs> yeah, <right>? <laughs> or me or, or, hey, or me, Rob, or me. Hey, Anytime you guys want, I can help you out. You let me know, and I'll hook you up with some stuff and, and get yeah. you in the right, going in the right direction. All right, we're getting way sidetracked here. Let's go back to the ah. charts. So we're talking right. about Apple. Yeah, so I'm out of the trade already. Okay. So now tomorrow's another day. What does it do tomorrow? I don't know. But if it breaks that 171.72, retests it, and fail, I'm looking at the 166.51 as my target. I mean, that's where we're headed. If we break to the upside... That's wonderful. If I come down first and, and move to the 171, 72 level and bounce, then I'll use the 176, 87 as a target. Uh, but I never go in this saying, you know, I want, I'm, I plan to hold in this for three days, three months, three years. It's not a Warren Buffett rule here. Buy it for a day, be willing to hold it for 10 years. It's buy it for a day and be willing to get out of it in a minute if that's what it right. takes. If my target is hit, if my stop is hit, I'm done. I bracket the trade. Here's the entry. I put in a target. I put in a stop closer to the stop than the target and i'm out of that trade once it triggers and that's the extent of it so we've had three of them go off like that today so uh, uh two to the third one i'd missed i was busy with something else and didn't get it netflix was the second one so let me go ahead and zoom in on this a little out rather on it so let's get a bigger picture on Netflix, okay. So we had a nice move up on Netflix. We failed on our um, fibs. We are in a bearish bias, not true bear, but we will be after today, true bear. It's bearish, but it's not true bear. The moving averages are not quite in the right order. We've got a, a zone down here. If you've ever read um, the China study, they talk about the blue zones around the world. China study is a book on health. And they talk about blue zones of these healthy places around the world, Okinawa and places like that. And I, coined the same name when we have a confluence of, of two of our lines. So we've got a 100 point level and a fib line there. So and we're within $4 is the, the rule for it. So we're able to go ahead and draw a box in there. And that box just it's added strength. It's not just a sheet of plywood on the floor. It's four sheets of plywood on the floor. Now it's a stronger floor than just having one in there. So we broke today and we came back up into that box and we failed. Right, so we picked up the 598 puts at five bucks. So let's see where we are right now. Uh, let's put in Netflix. Uh, 
I got 598, 590 puts, sorry. 590 puts was right here. We picked them up at five, and they are 760 by 780 right now, mid-price 770. All right, nice, nice, nice. No, oh, hold on, what am I doing? 590. Oh, the, yeah, 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 there bad. we go. Okay. No, it's good, it's good. No, $5, yeah, yeah no, no, we're good, we're good. Uh, okay, just checking. <laughs> we're, we're absolutely good. Uh, no, I, my mouse had moved, and I had it on a different strike, and I thought I was reading the wrong one. Um, so overall, nice move on them as well today. Now, the one I missed was W Day. Right, so we look at W day. Look at that. I mean, look at that move. So when we move between two fib likes, two fib lines like this, I call it ping pong. It's a ping pong trade. You move right in between those levels, and you just tend to bounce back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So we're talking about two seventy seven down to two seventy. Let's call it so a seven dollar move on W day. So all we look for is the break, which it opened here. It you could see clearly it retested that level. And then we look for the fail and the rollover. And that rollover, that fail, gave us the opportunity to enter the trade. And we would be out of this one at about 260, uh, 270, 271, 272, somewhere around that range would be our first exit. We'd exit half the trade uh, and then manage the second half if we were looking for a runner. Uh, today, I would have just been taking the full trade off all at once. All right. Any questions for Rob, Roy? Drop them in. The chat, uh, his link, which should be in the description if it's not, uh, wealthbuildershq.com. You can always uh, learn more from Rob there, uh, but it's in the chat as well. Uh, so everyone who wants to know more about that. Um, okay, Rob, so we walked through uh, setups on both sides of the market here. Um, do you want to just like zoom out for a second uh, and look beyond just today and even beyond like tomorrow? We, of course, have... The FOMC, sure. we have the FOMC tomorrow, so that's that's obviously weighing on things here today, and <clears> we'll <throat> probably continue to weigh on things uh, tomorrow. But um, if we can look a little bit longer out, maybe like the rest of the year here, um, what are you sure. thinking? What are you thinking? What are you feeling about about where we're at? So right now, the S&P falls. If we close right here, Spencer, we fall into a neutral bias. That neutral bias tells me that I am not taking any directional trades at all uh, that are overnight. Nothing can be held overnight if with the S&P and the, a neutral bias. So if we can get back above that eight moving average, we're back into the bullish mode, and then I'm looking to take long trades. Uh, I think there's a potential that we test the all-time highs again before the end of the year, but I think it's just a test. I don't think we're breaking out yet. I think there's too much uncertainty with what's going on with Congress, with this uh, Build Back Better bill, um, or what's better known as the, oh, God, I think you'll make me broke bill. Um, so I'm not really sure that that's going to get done. There was talks of today on CNBC of does that get done by Christmas time? I don't, I don't see it happening. Um, so that right there is weighing on the market of where's the cost going to be. The FOMC coming out saying now it looks like, uh, was it about 65 or 68 percent that are in May they're going to raise in seven in the mid 70s that they're going to raise in June. So uh, I think that all of these things are weighing on it. I don't, I don't believe we're going to see anything clear definition enough to tell us we've got a clear path up or down yet uh, this year. Okay, uh, for, I, for, okay. For, forget the SPY. Forget the SPX. SPX is, is, is rigged. It's got five stocks in it. Let's go to the Russell, a true representation of the stock market. Okay. The RUT, R-U-T. Yeah. So let's look at the RUT or the IWM, whatever you want. No, I, I like RUT because I trade it okay. regularly. Actually, if you see, all, it's not all on here, but these are all iron condors that we've done. We have not had one iron condor expire or one iron condor go against us this year. We got close, but none of them went against us. The entire year, we do it every 30 days, uh, and it's worked extremely well. So when we look right now at RUT, where are we? Uh, let's go back here. Let's get that the full view of the FIB, right? So we've got our Fibonacci drawn in here. We've exploded to the upside. We had a great fail come back off of here. And now you've got to look at moving averages. And where are our moving averages? The eight is on the bottom, the, the pink. The green is in the middle, the 21. The brown is on top, the 55. So we're in a bearish bias. At this point, I don't see us getting to a bullish bias this year on rut. Could, it be, could I be wrong? Absolutely. But the overall pattern when we got this fail this push back up and this drop, if we break this cluster of bottoms, I do not see us making it back up above the moving averages before year end. 
right? We could easily see it. You know, this has been a stronghold for us. If we break this bottom, we're looking at these right here, all of this clustering that took us down on these lows right in here, which puts us at uh, about 2132. That 2132 is the support. Break the support and it's Katie bar the doors. I'm trading to the downside on this. But not right now. Right now you're just neutral? No, right now I'm bearish on the right. Oh, okay. I'm bearish on the right. That the pattern the the bias the bias comes in all based on moving averages. This is a bearish bias. Pink on the bottom, green on top, brown on the uh, green in the middle, brown on right, top. Right, right. This right, is right. a bullish bias over here. Okay? Pink on top, green in the middle, brown but, on the bottom. But so, but you'll be even more bearish. It's like it, there are degrees of bearish. Like you're bearish, but you'll be more bearish if you fall through the support. For the moment, we haven't done that, so you're not as bearish. Bearish, but well, not as bearish. Correct. If I push out a window and it's one foot to the floor, or if I push out a window and it's 10 feet to the floor, there's a different fear factor, right? right. My fear factor here is just that. My fear is up to this fib level, which is where we're at now. We keep going. And my fear takes me down to 2026, which gives me a 162 point drop, right? If we break those bottoms in there. So it's just a matter of how far away we are from the floor. That's what's setting me up for how much fear I have in that position. And I saw somebody, it might've been say, Hey, or I don't remember voodoo was asking about the iron condors. Absolutely. I mean, we're still looking to write iron condors in this every 30 days we write an iron condors. Right. I'll be doing the bear call side first and see if it continues to fall. If it does, then we'll put the bull puts on. And uh, who was it in chat? Is it, is it, is it Voodoo or uh, Easy Mike saying the problem with the Russell is that AMC is the top holding? Yeah, but AMC is half, not even half of a percentage. It's point, it's point four nine percent. How much could point four nine percent be really be affecting this thing? And that, I that's it. why the I, Russell is two thousand stocks. That's it's tough to move that on any one company. Yeah, I get it. It's the largest holding, but it's point four nine percent, right? It's not, it's not, not even yeah. half of one. So anyway, uh, but I, I see your point. It, I, I just don't necessarily agree. Okay, what about Matty Ice brought up Ford? Let's look at Ford here. Is Ford still? Is Ford? Like, is it, are we at twenty two yet in Ford? Where are we at? All right. So let's see. let's zoom in a little bit more. So we haven't hit 22 yet. Uh, this clustering, this rectangle that's happened right over here. Right? I love the pattern. I like the breakout we had. We pulled back, but got no bounce. See, that's why I don't take breakouts. I take retests. We got a pullback, but we never got a bounce off it. We pulled right back inside of here. For me to take it bullish, get above this 2042 level-ish, and then look at that uh 2147 as our first top but here let's do this so if we look we've got about 2186 is going to be our resistance in there so that's the first test bounce off the 20 and a half 2186 if you want to hold it longer, I would put a tight stop on it, but I would be scaling out of some of my position before it got to 2186. Uh, I like Ford. I like them a lot. They're a great naked put company. You could pick up about 5 or 8% a week on Ford. So uh, I'm good on them, but not, not in the pattern they're in now. This is a bullish neutral. Between the below the 8, above the 21, it's bullish neutral. So day trades, if we can get them, but there's nothing in here for me to take. Moving averages are going to get in our way a little bit. So I got to get above the 2050, Spencer. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll look at a, a high growth name, Asana. It's been brutalized, taken out back, and beaten up. It's a growth tech. So it's moving with the rest of growth tech here again today, frankly. I, I don't so even, is it ASA or ASNA? It's, it's ASAN. I haven't even looked at the chart, and I can tell you that it's probably down. I'm just assuming it is. And I'm not looking it looks at like it got today. a quick pop today, but. But small, nothing. I mean, the overall pattern market is down on it. But um, so we're sitting right at the 618 fib line, which is the most important fib level. Moving averages are true bear. I mean, if we pull back up to and close at that 6376 tonight, I'm looking at 4933 as our first stopping point to the downside. So what do options look like on this thing? That's a good question. ASAN, let's see. 
not one that I normally trade. All right, so no weeklies uh, is the first uh, first thing about it. Big mm. strike difference, $5 increments up here. We yep. got two halves down here, but we're already out of the money. So keeping it in the money on directional, 1150 by 12 is not horrible. There's enough open interest at 498. Uh, we have no volume on, you know, very little on some of these positions today. So that's on call side. Puts maybe more because it is down. <laughs> so let's see what's going on. Well, that's okay. I mean, I always check calls because that's where you're going to find more of your activity is calls usually. Not for a particular not, day. But... Not, not on a stock in a downtrend like this you won't. <laughs> right. True. True. We're looking at uh, the January options. So these okay. have been out for a year now. Right. Um, so let's see. We're looking at that 65-ish delta. So we've got 1440 by 80. Not bad. 240 open interest. Uh, we've got 15 volumes. So again, very low volume on them um that just i'm just not a fan of that five dollar increment on it but puts would be the play for this i would not be looking at uh at anything even the bounce in here i don't want to take it but give me the downside absolutely i'd probably scale out of half the trade at that midpoint so at about 57 i'd be looking at half the trade all right a couple more here uh Easy Mike. A few people asked about uh, Hood. Easy Mike pointed out the February the February uh, thirty dollar calls in Hood. So we talked about this on the, we do a show every every morning at nine o'clock. Also yeah. on the on YouTube, and we talked about this on the show the other day, where we're looking at we were looking at this twenty one half level, and we had come down and tested the level and bounced, and we used that as our key. And look what happened. We broke. We broke. So what uh, what option were we looking at there? Thirty dollar calls in hood. Thirty dollar call. So definitely well out of the money. Um, what expiration? February. Feb. Okay. Yeah. All right. So let's go look I, at yeah. Feb. So I've got the Feb. There's sixty six days in there for the February option. All right. So. We got February. Sorry, Spencer. Too many numbers. What what strike? 30. 30. All right. So we're looking at a delta of 20. So you're trading an out-of-the-money position. You've got to have a, a either A, it is a speculative trade that you're willing to throw money at and not worry what happens to it, which is fine, as long as you know what you're looking for when you go into the trade. The other side of that coin is that option tells me there's a 20% chance that come expiration day, you will have intrinsic value, cash value in that option. I'm not a fan of the let's give it a shot and see if it works. <clears throat> if I am bullish on it, truly bullish on it, you know, at least push me up to the 40 delta. That would be the bare minimum. But for me, normally it's at 65 to 85 is where I'm looking at. If I were bullish, right? Or, or it doesn't matter or bearish. But if right now, look at the pattern. This is a piano that's falling off a hundred story building and you're standing on the ground trying to catch it. You might be right. It may bounce. I just don't have one question. Just one question to ask yourself. Okay. Do you have a clear and concise entry, a compelling reason to take an entry in that direction? If yeah, it's speculative, it's, then that's okay. Yeah, the fact that it's gone down a lot is not in itself a compelling entry. Uh, oh, it was at 50. Now it's at 20. Yeah. So, so Rob, do you have... Um, <laughs> Do you have a way to play these stocks like this that are at all-time lows? Like you can't look left and find a support because it's at all-time lows. Do you just wait for for some sort of reversal, or do you try to find what could be a pivot point with the with the Fibonacci levels? So the biggest thing here is newer and newer position, right? You just don't have enough history. I mean, look at the moving averages. You barely have them. I don't even have a 55 on here because it's not long enough term. So on this, it's, it just becomes more speculative, and that's the way that I trade them. I own some of these newer issues, right, like uh, BITO. I'm a fan of Bitcoin. I think it's going to 100 grand at some point, so I'm going to invest nice. in it. I, I bought into it. Uh, it came down. I bought some more. But I want to be careful that you're not hitting some of these stocks. I mean, look at rent, right, rent the runway. Uh, not doing well, and there's brutal. two or three others. Brutal, Rob. Yeah, it's just brutal. I mean, but listen, and then Hood – exploded when it came out right i got i got in on hood by pure sheer dumb luck 
<laughs> right place, right time. I got a double and I sold it and then it came down big the next day. Uh, there are still some people in my company that might own a few shares left that they own on it. They got out of some and were holding on because they thought it would be that, that big run. I just don't have a reason here. So, uh, Aaron, I would step back, position number one in the chair, and there's really not much here. Short term on this, I could do a bear call spread. It's bearish. I could t trade a bear call spread. I'm just not going to get a whole lot of premium on a bear call spread right now. If we're trading at $18, so I'm going to look at about the 20s, right? I can do the 2021, and I can pick up five cents. Hold on. Let's go shorter term. My bad. So we're looking at 2021s. Not even, right? You're looking at, uh, well, it's okay, I guess, uh, 18 cents in there for a $1 spread. So that's about a 22% rate of return on that, assuming it expires worthless. But that's the trade on it, is to trade a short-term credit spread, is all I would do on it, Aaron. Got it. Let's do let's do this one from Voodoo, and then and then Rob, uh, we'll let you hop here. Uh, he's throwing out a uh, a put credit spread on SoFi, uh, so let's pull up the SoFi chart. Um, Voodoo is looking at the thirteen fifty six level. I don't know what that corresponds to, if anything, or if he just pulled it out of, right. pulled it out of out of a hat. Um, what level? Thirteen what? Thirteen fifty six in SoFi. <clears throat> All right, so I've got a thirteen sixty seven, which is what's called a fibit at that point. And he's looking at a bull put spread, mm -hmm. right? So, again, right now, is there a compelling reason to take a bullish trade? Unless he, he, it is credit, he said, not debit, correct? Yes. Okay. So it's a credit spread. So I, I just don't have any compelling reason to take a bullish entry on it unless what he's looking at, you said 1356. Where was my low here? That's, that's, that, that's what it is. That's yeah. the lowest, 1356. It gives me some confluence at that level. But I would wait for it to get to that level then and bounce before I would take that trade. Uh, and then if you're looking at a bull put spread, what does that put us? About a dollar difference from where we are right now. So let's see on SoFi. So at 14.37, we're looking at a bull put spread. So if we go 13, yeah, there's nothing for this week. Let's go one more week. If you go 13, 12. So you got about 16 cents in there for $1 in there. So you're looking at about 20% for that. So that's not too bad. Small, no, small uh, dollar amount, but the rate of return is pretty good. Yeah, good. Voodoo said, yep, looking for a bounce, then the entry. Got it, Voodoo. That's the way to do it, man. You, you've heard me teach it a hundred times before. You need to find that bounce first, then look to take the trade. Don't catch the fallen piano. Get out the way. It's going to break on top of your head. All right, Rob, this will be the last one. There's a few people in the chat have been talking about Lucid, LCID. I don't know. If, do, do you see a setup here? Guys, I, I wouldn't say Lucid is 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 running today. It's up 1.6%. 1, 1. That's I guess on a day the market is down, that's, that's better than that's better than it looks but um rob do you see a setup here in lucid at all <laughs> so on uh let's see wrong one lcid i must hit the wrong key no lcid correct yeah it's the one why am i not catching it there i don't know i'm not it's for some reason it's not i'm getting lci let me go to the other charts i'm gonna trade station All right, so let's start off with the daily chart. Let's maximize that. All right, overall, the pullback on the chart has been fantastic. All right, let's go into... All right, so... I don't normally use TradeStation 10, but your the platform that you use here doesn't like <laughs> um, trade station nine and a half so let's do this here All right so are we running today where are we at we're we're barely moving today 61 cents 
yeah, forty dollars stock. I mean, from an intraday standpoint, no. Um, when we go look at the the time frame, let's go to a daily chart. We've had that nice run up and that pullback, but yeah. look at the moving averages. We're still in a bearish bias on our moving averages. So, I'd be looking for the push up to about forty one and three quarters, and then the fail, and I'd be looking for the fail down about that thirty five and a half. Okay. Is where I look for on. And we're at we're at seventy five right now. That's where we're at thirty. 3875? Uh, let's saw? go back to it. Yeah, I think that's where I saw. Yeah, 3977 right oh, now. Okay. Yeah, so we're looking at these bottoms in here. I'd come off of the bottom of the body is what I'd work off of. So about 36 and a half is what I'd be looking for the pullback to. Give me a close near there and a bounce, and then I'll look for the trade up to 41 well, and de three quarter. Define, define bounce exactly. So in an ideal world, it closes right at that level. From there, we get that bounce to the upside. It could be a small move up. Uh, it could be, a, preferably, it would be a pullback first, right? If we can break that level a little bit and shake out all the looky-loos that are not real traders that are just out there, you know, giving this a shot, and then get the bounce up from there and get me up 50 cents a dollar from there, that's where I look for my entry. And then my, my stop, see, this is where my, my system plays out so well is your stop is so short meaning you don't give a lot of risk in the trade. I'm looking for the 3 or $4 move, but I'm only risking a dollar or two on the downside, right? I've got a very small risk I'm taking on the trade. And it's not a guarantee of we only risk a dollar on the trade. It, it comes down to where is the, the, the level you're going to take the, the exit at based on where the support level is, right? In this case, where the bounce we're looking for. So um, the bounce would just be move, you know, move down a little bit and then back up, or again, just a small move to the upside, a buck or so, and we'll take the entry. I feel like you just uh, spoke out of both sides of your mouth because on the one hand you said lean on that level for support, but then you said no, no, no. Actually, everyone else is going to do that. I'm going to wait till it goes below that level and shake everyone out. No, no. So I'd like it to close near that level. Okay, okay maybe I just didn't say it well. I'd like it to close right. near that level. The next day, I would love to see a small move to the downside first. Okay. okay. Support, listen, it's not truly a floor like in your house, right, or in your office. Support is a relative area. It's there, but it's not perfect. So a sure. small wick breaking through and bouncing, look what happened two days ago, right? I mean, look at it exactly there. We had this low on this candle, and then we broke down lower on this one before we started to bounce. That's what I'm referring to. Give me a small stretch down. And same day, then bounce, and that's where I'm looking at the entry. All it does is it shakes out those that have got very tight stops. Uh, and that, a lot of that is the market maker, right? They, they see those stops out there, right? They know exactly where your stop loss is, right? If I got 100 people wanting to buy and 6,000 people wanting to sell, I'm going to take advantage of the sell side. I don't care that yeah. a couple extra people got away with a little extra cash. Good for them. But I had 5,900 extra trades I made that went in our favor because of Oh, we made an adjustment to the price. How about that? <laughs> right, right, right. All right, guys, we've kept Robert Roy for far too long, but we lo we love him. Robert Roy uh, joins us on the show to talk options. Wealth Builders HQ. If you're not going to hit the like button for for us, do it for him. Rob, a pleasure as always. Uh, we'll talk to you again uh, ne next week. Right? Oh, last thing, Rob. Vaz trades in the chat wants you to to. Bring the market up. Rob, bring the market up. To bring the market, but I don't need the market to go up. I just need the market to go. <laughs> I don't there need to go, go up. I, I'm sorry, man. I appreciate it, but uh, nothing I can do about it. Not, not with the Fed coming out to manana. That's going to deal with it. a lot of it. So That's it. Yep. So uh, tomorrow morning, are you just going to be hanging out in cash until the meeting, or are you going to try to play it? No, I'm not doing any. You'll see lighter volume during the day. I usually take Fed days off until the, the announcement comes out, and I'll look to trade in the afternoon. Nice, nice. All right, yeah, Rob. I'm just staying away. Have a good one. We'll talk to you again next week. All right, guys. Take care. Right. Thanks. Appreciate it. Catch you later. All right. So, well, where are we at, AB? We got a half hour left. Um, we're so red today, man. Yeah, it is what it is. Oh wow, you're feeling uh, you're feeling resigned, defeated. No, don't care. No, I mean it's just like. The markets, they go down, they go They up. go up, they go down? They go up, they go down. Yeah. No. So, I don't think it's anything to freak out over. And honestly, with you. Uh, what are you looking at? Uh, the TV next to you. Don't worry about it. Oh. Oh. Yeah. 
Um, breaking news: Goldman Sachs names Chipotle a top restaurant pick for twenty. We don't care about that. We don't care about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm ex- actually excited for the Fed meeting tomorrow because I feel like uh, you know everyone is so ready for them to announce rate hikes and, and the market's gonna come, come down for it and all this and i'm just sitting here like we don't know what's gonna happen you know yeah so we are gonna live stream the uh, the fed meeting because the 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 uh, announcement comes at two and then i think 2 30 is the press conference so we're gonna live stream that um tomorrow and i i, I think this is probably the Oof. biggest fed meeting uh well since March of last year, for sure, when they threw the phone book at, at the pandemic. But before that, probably in, at least since like 2015, 2016, when they signaled that they were raising rates for the first time since, since the recession. So this is, this is a really, really, really big meeting um, because we, we, already, we, we know somewhat what they're going to do, right? We already know that the, about the tapering. We already know um, – probable rate hikes but um they have a chance tomorrow to like solidify their plan well Uh, and and just to be clear i think it's important to keep some perspective um uh, rate hikes are really only bearish in the short term right we've seen in the past um a a lot of growth continue even in environments where we do have uh you know i right now anything is higher interest rates than what we have right now True. um but we've seen in the past times where we've seen equities continue to grow even with uh, a strong interest rate so if we if we do get that rate hike and we see tech get killed for a day or two it's not like oh my god amazon or amazon's gonna lose 50 percent of its value yeah no. it might get hit for a couple days and lose five percent and then be back on its trajectory it was before the rate uh for sure so sure. it's just all about having that um, perspective. And I know it's tough, especially on a, a big red day, it, especially if your portfolio is weighted a lot toward these tech stocks. You might see your portfolio down, um, you know, say 5% in a single day. It's not fun to look at, but I, it's just important to keep that perspective that just because they raise heights, th- raise rates, which we don't know if they're going to do or not, but if they do, um, it does not mean, um, you know, all these tech names are just going to all of a sudden be in a, downtrend forever yeah to you know just to be clear like the reason i am bullish stocks and this includes tech stocks as well even the beaten down ones is because frankly like let, let's just pretend hypothetically we're in an inflationary environment not not quite let's say not quite as bad as the 70s but but um maybe like the early 90s okay let's, let's call it that um where are you going to put your money you're not going to hold treasuries you're not going to hold cash maybe a little bit of crypto but no most people are going to own stocks because that's how that's 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 the number one way to hedge against inflation i suppose like gold all right throw throw gold out there but no tina there is no alternative it's it's stocks that's what it is that's how you outperform so that's how you make it through so you know i'm still i can't speak to the next day or week or month but like if we are in a longer term period of inflation and rising rates, um, I, I get what it means on paper, but in reality, I f- in practice, I feel like it just means everyone just has to has to you have to own stocks. Yeah, and honestly, interest rates, uh, like raising interest rates, as long as that's coupled with strong economic growth and, and yep. good jobs numbers, that's a sign of a right. strong economy. That's just that's just my take. Going I, like negative, I could be wrong. going negative. What? I could be wrong, but that's just my take. Oh, I thought you said I was wrong. No, no, no. Going like negative rates or having zero percent interest rates is actually not a, a a sign of a great overall economy. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see what it is. Now do Japan. <laughs> what okay. are Japan's interest rates like? Uh, they no, they, they went negative. That, that's always your argument is like now now do Japan because Japan tanked their market. Well, what's for- interesting is Japan actually has less inflation than a lot of other. Uh, countries, yeah, including ours, right? But Japan now. took 30 years to come back. That's always the argument. All right, let's bring on Tim Quast, market structure ads. Let's see what the market structure is telling us ahead of tomorrow's FOMC Bonanza Extravaganza. Oh, look at that. Bug Glug got his swag in the mail. See, some people get their swag. Yeah, okay. If we owe you swag, I think we're mostly up to date as far as the shipping, right, Aaron? I did a lot last week. Yeah, yeah so he did he's a lot. probably on the way. 
Um, there actually have been a few other people that have uh, who forgot to send us their addresses who since have since I've done that shipment. So I have to add those people and then we will be all caught up. And then there are a few eternal people like from within Benzinga that I owe swag to. If you're internal at Benzinga, you're at the back of the line. Yeah, 100%. All right. Tim Quas, what's going on, man? How are we doing? I don't I don't have the shirt. Okay, Tim, well, you can, send us can we your add address. Tim? Can we get Tim on the list? As Tim, send us your address. <laughs> or t- Tim, send us one of your five addresses. I don't know if you're going to be down in Texas or down out in Colorado. I don't know where you're going to be. So uh, send me one of your five addresses. Charleston. And I'll, Charleston. I'll, I'll, I'll send swag to, to one of them. In the British Virgin Islands, actually. That's the, uh, uh, that's the next. No, no, no. That's too expensive. No, no. Too expensive. Just, just because, just, just as a principle of the thing, no. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm gonna have to just get my own shirt. I guess. Get your own. Yeah, get if, your you're own the, if, if you're in the if you're in the Virgin Islands, get your own damn shirt. <laughs> right? You don't even. You don't need our help with that. All right, Tim. Uh, uh, what what is the market telling you as we are now 24 hours and change away from uh, the, the the FOMC announcement? That probably once again the 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 realm of punditry is misunderstanding the equity market. That's what oh, yeah. I think. Um, you know, it's not that hard to look at the Fed's balance sheet. Uh, they actually publish it every week, um, and uh, because I'm one of those people who uh, likes to talk about monetary policy and market structure at cocktail parties and clear rooms. I'm also one of those people who reads the Fed's balance sheet. So I'm looking at the Fed's balance sheet, and while they may be talking about the things they're going to do, the fact is the Fed's balance sheet continues to expand. Uh, reverse repurchases are, well, and the way these things, we'll talk, I'll talk briefly about this and then talk about market structure uh, because I, I understand both of these things. So reverse repurchases are ways to give cash to the Fed, which continues to get counted as part of the money supply and get paid for it. So now the Europeans are doing that because they're awash in euros. So they're converting their euros into dollars because we're awash in dollars. Interest rates are, so they're getting paid uh, five basis points for that uh, in the overnight facility. So you can look can, at that. Can you, brief, can you briefly explain that for oh, people that sure. don't, don't know what the repo and the reverse repo yeah. market is? Yeah, let, in fact, here, because I think all, all well-informed, you don't have to go do this. But I think it's important to understand how it works and realize the Fed doesn't follow generally accepted accounting principles. You can't apply gap financial thinking to the Fed's balance sheet. But here it is. So you can go to www.federalreserve.gov forward slash releases, and it will tell you then forward slash H41 will give you the list. So here's where they are. And they publish them every Thursday afternoon. And so here's the latest Fed balance sheet. And I've been reading these things for 20 years. And, uh, I, and I'll reinforce that they, they, I, I went to a professional association meeting some years ago, pro- probably now close to 10 years ago, and that the, the president of the AICPA, the National Association of Certified Public Accountants, went through this and said, you know, you, they, they don't follow the accounting principles that all you public companies follow, but here's how to understand what this is telling you. So I'm just going to show you something, folks. So here's the size of the Fed's balance sheet right there, $8.7 trillion, and it's up $1.4 trillion over the last year, and it's up from last week even. All right, so then we want to know, well, what is the ex- amount of excess reserves, which is counted as cash too, that the banks are holding? because they can get paid a little bit for it. Look, if I can't loan it out, but the Fed will pay me five or 10 basis points, well, that's what I'm gonna do. Well, that's up $50 billion in a week, and it's $4.3 trillion for perspective. In uh, the, the, the autumn of 2007, this figure was $10 billion. So now it's 4.3 trillion. So I look at those figures. I wanna know which direction are they going? Because here's the point. If you go back through history, through 2014, very important point, where the Fed stopped expanding its balance sheet, uh, you, you go back to, to 2008, eight, nine, when we did QE1, the, the markets fall when the Fed's balance sheet starts to shrink. 
not when they raise interest rates. It's when the Fed's balance sheet peaks and starts to fall. And that happened, by the way, in August of 2014. And then the market had a very difficult time and oil prices collapsed because we stopped expanding the supply of dollars. And I'm going to get to market structure edge because it doesn't matter what's going on. There are always things to trade, but you always have to understand supply and demand. Here we're looking at the supply and demand for dollars. The last thing I like to look at, well, there are two things. Here's these reverse repurchases that I was talking about. See that number? 1.8 trillion of those. That's the overnight number. <laughs> so it means all wow. these banks all over the planet are parking overnight $1.8 trillion with the Fed because you taxpayers are paying all these foreign banks to exchange their currencies for dollars and get paid for it. All right. So that's going on. So long as those things occur, we are desperately trying to keep the dollar from strengthening. And it's because all these other you know, central banks increase the supply of currency as well. So then the last thing I check is mortgage-backed securities. This is what ties to tapering. When the Fed says, we're going to stop buying these things, what you want to see is that these two numbers start to decline, and this monthly commitment to buy securities uh -huh. begins to decline. And less than until that happens, they're not uh -huh. doing it, okay? And they're not doing it. That number's actually up from last week, okay? So they can talk all they want. Which brings us around to your question, Spencer, when you said, well, what, I, what do I think is going on? I think that they're testing rhetoric. They, this is what they always do. They will test their capacity to talk the dollar down, and they want to try to prepare people, but it doesn't mean they're actually doing it. What is actually occurring right now is all the month-end stuff. Spencer, you talked about this Monday right as I left pre-market prep. You were talking about the NASDAQ 100 reconstitution. Uh -huh. That is a big deal. Let's just take mm -hmm. NVIDIA as an example out of that. A lot, I like to trade it. A lot of your audience likes to trade NVIDIA. Why is it getting cooked? Well, because it's up 60% the last six months, and it's owned by an immense number of ETFs, over 300 of them, and you don't own those shares. They do. And as we come to the end of the year, they're going to wash out the associated capital gains from everything that went up, including the meme stocks. Everything that is appreciated, they're going to look at and say, well, we're going to owe taxes on these at the end of the year. Well, what can we do about it? I can show you what ETFs can do, but I'll just summarize it for you. Uh, so, we Tim, wait, Tim, Tim, why do you always try to make me hate ETFs, man? It, because they're lousy derivative instruments. They <laughs> des they destroy the integrity of the market. Close your that ears, Spencer. I, yeah, but look, I, I mean, come a, on. <laughs> but, Tim, what about? I, I, I don't think they're genius. But that's what's happening. So if I'm BlackRock, I can take this NVIDIA stock I've got and put it in that basket and shove it across the table to Morgan Stanley and say, I need, because the tech stocks have come down 7%, I need some IYM, BlackRock Tech Fund. Give me those mm -hmm. shares and you'll get NVIDIA. So what's, Black, what's Morgan Stanley going to do? They're going to buy puts on NVIDIA and immediately dump it. And then NVIDIA goes down. Everybody says, oh, the growth trade's broken down. And no, it's value. No, it's not. Oh this is all part of year-end tax planning in a complex that owns trillions upon trillions of dollars. Here's the thing. It could end like that. I mean, what's to cause BlackRock to say, well, let's just bring NVIDIA back tomorrow or Friday at a stepped-up tax basis because, wow, it's cheap right now. And then Morgan Stanley will have to go round it all up. <laughs> And they'll get ETF shares in exchange, and they'll buy calls on it. And whoosh, it goes up 7%, and everybody goes, well, I guess we're not concerned about what the Fed said. If that Wait. happens tomorrow, then you and I can have this conversation next Monday about how these things actually work, because that's what's occurring. Go ahead. I, I, my question is going to open up a can of worms. So my, just my, go. go my, my question was, what about this idea that you, you hear people throwing out there that uh, investment firms need to kind of reallocate their portfolios if they need to meet certain percentages of, of stocks to bonds. So maybe that could cause uh, funds to be selling stocks to, I don't know what the standard is. What is it? 80% stocks, 20% bonds. So if they, if their stocks have gone up and they're above that threshold, they'll need to sell some to reach that. Uh, is that a real thing that happens? Sure. Of course it is. But, uh, but uh, the, the, a conservative mix like that, so we have the, roughly that mix, maybe a little bit different than that, in our very conservative deferred compensation plans. 
uh, because we want to preserve it. Uh, in our 401k plans for our employees, you probably have them too. Uh, it's a it's a more aggressive mixture of equities versus bonds. But yes, those things are going to have to be trued up. They actually have to be trued up quite periodically. You know, right. Every quarter, quarter, I believe. Exactly. So you're going to make those resets. It's as we get. But the only time that you do big tax planning is at the end of the year. But from, so, a, from, a, from, a, from a macro level, if you have a really strong quarter, yeah. could you infer then at the end of the quarter because it was a strong quarter and stocks have gone up, that they will need to sell some stocks to, to bring that uh, percentage allocation back down to that 80-20. Again, that's just an arbitrary number yes. I'm throwing out there. Yes, you could. Now, okay. keep in mind that the other piece of that puzzle is I also have capital to deploy. So what the, the unknown is, what is the divide? So if I sell things for tax planning purposes because I or uh, because I need to rebalance because I've got you know stocks have appreciated and uh, bonds have not appreciated quite as much but it's a pretty good year for bonds uh, so I reset those but at the same time I've got all of this money coming in we continue to personally we continue to pump a lot of money into our plans we haven't stopped it and I doubt most people have so if I do a little tax planning but I still have to deploy capital, which thing am I going to do first? Well, it's not difficult to sort out, is it? I'm going to tax plan first to bring equities down, and then I'm going to deploy my new capital. So how could, when would that happen? Well, it happens right around index rebalances and options expirations, generally speaking. Well, when does that happen? Thursday and Friday and into next week, right into when the market closes. 23rd will be out of this period. All of that month, uh, year, month and year end stuff, quarter end stuff. And uh, so maybe that's when it, I'm not promising that will be the case, but it will yeah. not surprise me at all if we suddenly see the market go. We have a 500, 800 point move on the Dow and the QQQ soars and people go, well, what happened? Well, we just talked about it. That's what happened. I feel like your 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 underlying thesis in general seems to be that the market moves are always disingenuine, and they're not what you think they are, and it's due to market plumbing. And is well, my question is, is the market ever genuine to you? <laughs> like, oh, I think it's very genuine, but okay. I think you have to understand. I think you have to understand what it's doing. I, I without offense to the many people who prognosticate about the equity market, a lot of them bring. 1990s thinking to trying to understand how it works. Uh, we, we don't properly understand the diminished role of stock picking in the, in the US market, but here's sure. what it is. You know, I mean, people don't think about this. If we just look at, if I could do this for any company, right? So I just happen to have United Natural Foods, big supplier to, to Whole Foods, wholesaler. So I can look at the, what the, over what period of life. So this is October 1 to December 14. Well, what's the yeah. composition of the volume for this, for this company. Well, there it is. 10% of the market is stock picking. 16% uh, right. is derivatives. 16% is, is indexes, ETFs, quants. 59% of it is, is just machines trading price. Well, everybody's thinking should reflect what is actually occurring in the market. If you're going to talk okay. about what the market does, then it should be predicated on actual facts, not these notions that we have about how the stock market works. Okay, that's so that's I suppose, what I do. Yeah, I suppose that's fair. The 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 prevalence of machines and, and indexes does screw with the natural order of things. Uh, well, so it maybe, is the natural order. Well, what I would right, say that, is that's it's very point. easy to understand. Yeah. So I told people last week, and we talked about it, didn't we? Yeah. We talked about it last week, too. I said, look, the market could very well be down Monday and Tuesday. Why? Because not because for a, an understandable reason. If this process is occurring and there are market makers there, they're going to be short the stocks coming out. Then they're going to reverse into options expirations. Now, if I'm wrong and they don't finish that process, then that won't occur. But let's find out, right? Thursday, uh, index options expirations. Index options are used, uh, Aaron, to your point, to true up those balances. A lot of times that's what happens. These big uh, money managers, they don't go and buy and sell everything. They say, we need futures contracts that are of this amount to offset that difference. That's what they, because it's much cheaper and easier. I don't have to go pay some broker to move billions of dollars. I just go to Goldman Sachs and buy a basket of futures. Well, yeah. that's going to happen on Thursday and Friday, both. 
So I think I don't think the market's disingenuous at all. I think it, okay. it tells us exactly what it's doing all of the time. Yeah, and and to me that what we were talking about earlier. I mean, I would be much more on the aggressive side compared to conservative. I don't I don't I don't need twenty percent of bonds or whatever the conservative allocation is. I I don't need the bonds at all, really. You don't. You should. No one does. Right? You, you, <laughs> no one does. You have very long horizons, but 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 particularly, you know, when, well, when you hope. get to be my age, yeah. then you have to be more right. aware of the, the the. What if the market goes down fifty percent? Well, I don't have another ten years. At least I don't want to, to to regain that. So I'm going to have a a, a higher aversion to risk. So then I use edge to trade. Right. I'm or we can also we can also and, you know other stuff. YOLO trade to try to make that 50% yeah. back. You, Tim, you Tim, can do that. we, we, can, we do can, can help you with that. Yeah. <laughs> we, but you know, I prefer to say take gains, not chances. That's what right. you want to do. All right. Um, so, I, so here's Tim, what I see. Sir. One last thing. So see yeah. all these curves? This is why I think that Wait, there's a possibility. Uh, it's not a, you know, it's not an absolute, but look at all the demand curves everywhere. I could pick almost any portfolio and the demand, clean energy, not great. Uh, but I, I could go all the way across these demand curves, and the demand curves are not jiving with what we see in the market. Well, that tells me that there are derivatives involved. If what you see in the supply and demand are ahead or behind of what is occurring in the market, the, the logical explanation most of the time is the role that derivatives play, because there's a derivative transaction, an offsetting transaction, and then an effect. And so I look at all this and say, generally, there is a possibility. There is a possibility of a sudden surge. Look, it might not happen, but it could. All right. I just want to say that the way that our camera and computers are set up, when I'm very focused, it does look like I'm sleeping. Uh, so, in, so in case in case you see in case you see this this picture uh, out on social media, I, that that was taken while Tim was talking. I'm not sleeping. I'm looking very intently at my computer. I promise. I was paying well, attention. He, he, at least he did. You know, usually people just leave the room. Uh, but you know, there's only yeah. the option of, of falling asleep. As, I can't. Well. That, that's what I would tell my teachers in high school too. I said, when it looks like I'm sleeping, I'm really just absorbing all the information. Right. Exactly. Um, it takes a lot. Anyway. All right, Tim. Thank you for ha hopping on the show today. It's great to have you. you as always, we'll see you, see you back on on all Monday right. for Market Structure Monday. Have a good one, Tim. Uh, with that, have a good have, have a great rest guys. of your week and thank you. Good good luck tomorrow if you're playing. Right, have the a good FOMC week. At all. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. All right. Oh, sorry, Tim. Oh, we cut Tim off there yeah, a little bit, but. Apologies. Love having Tim on. Right. A lot of great knowledge coming from him there. Check it out on MarketStructureEdge.com uh, if you haven't already. Real quick, Spencer. Yeah. I, I got a uh, my boy, my boy Richie in the chat. Uh, okay. Richie Judge talking about C E A C. S E A C. What? Am I t are we talking about the same thing? S E A C C change. Yeah. Well, you said C E A C. What I say? C E A C. I always get my C's and S's mixed up. Dude, I, I do that with letters. I may be dyslexic. Who knows? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not dyslexic. For some reason, <laughs> I just the if it's a soft C like okay. in centine, it might as well be an S to me. Right. I don't know. Funny. Um, Whatever. I have these oh, S S right S E A C calls. One dollar calls. I bought them last Friday. Look at that return. Not the actual return, but the percentage. 1,800%. Could you imagine if I would put some real money behind it? I, it would have made it for a more fun show. Yeah. Or yeah. maybe I wouldn't even be here. Maybe I'd be in Boca Raton. You, right you'd now. be with Tim in the British Virgin Islands. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. All right, that's good stuff, man. Congratulations. Yeah. We, see, the trick is with you, we, we need to get you playing with, with a little bit more capital. That's what we need to start. <laughs> right. Talk to Jason about that's it. That's what we need to start doing. The, the Benzinga... Live slush fund is is being constructed. Uh, I need to follow up with Luke about that, but um, um, great trade. All right, well, Spencer, I know you may have to hop right now, right? Yeah, I have a phone call I have to prepare for, so I I, I do have to hop, but uh, I kind of don't want to leave before this. But I I do have to leave, but I don't want to leave. I wanted to do a little competition with you. This this okay. website called Monkey Type. You type for thirty seconds, and it gives you your words per minute. All right, you want to do you mean you right now? Uh, well, we can't stream both of us at the same time, so I'll... no. But we'll do it separately, okay, right? Okay, so I'll go first, then you go. Yeah, and then I'll share mine. Oh man, this is tough because this is gonna be a lot of pressure with everyone watching. That's how it goes, right? Yeah, here let me refresh so I get some new words. All right, here we go. We need some tunage. Yeah, yeah play I, some. That, uh... That's on me. That's on me. No. There we go. Oh no. 
is good music for this. Nine seconds left. I'm pushing. Oh no, I screwed up. All right. I'm already gonna make excuses for mine because my my nails are a little bit too. Woo! One fifteen. Oh, he's definitely a faster and a better typer than I am. I've been practicing this. We've been having some fun with it in the office. All right. So process. all right. So one fifteen and ninety seven. And I'm gonna refresh. Right. All right. Hold on. Let me just refresh. All right. Do do I just start? Yeah. Oh God. Oh, sensor's rolling. No. Oh, oh God. Oh, no. Dude, my nails are... Uh... Oh, he, he said he was going to make excuses. The first one's nails. <laughs> mm. Ooh. That's pretty good. 105 91. All right, All right. I just threw I just threw the URL up on the screen. Uh if you want to go give it a try, it just takes 30 se whoa. Uh it just Spencer, takes Spencer, don't touch touch your mic cord. That's causing that noise. Sorry. Spencer's always fiddling over there. I like the fiddle. Um if if you want to give it a shot, it takes 30 seconds, do it. Send us a screenshot of your results. If you beat us, I don't know, maybe we'll maybe we'll send you something. Uh no. What? No. <laughs> What do you mean now? All right, whatever. Okay, I have to hop and prepare for a phone call. Can you take it home? Take us home? Yeah. All right. I've got four minutes to kill. All right, cool. The roadmap. Roadmap live next. They've got a member of the Board Eight Yacht Club uh, joining them. So I, I I need to learn more about the Board Eight Yacht Club. So I'm going to uh, tune into that as well. Hey, there's George Costanza. All right, y'all, let me know what you're watching. We can look at some charts in the last three minutes. Um, we can do anything. Let me, let me take a look at the at our trusty Benzinga Pro, see if we have any headlines that have come out in the past hour that I may have missed. We can do another check-in on crypto. Can I Photoshop the results? No, no, no. Uh, Jim Habashity is looking at Zim Shipping. All right, let me go ahead and get that pulled up on my Pro. That's not what I want to do. Zim Shipping. I don't know this company. Zim Integrated Shipping. Uh, so, so Jim, what's the play here? Is it because of everything going on with the in the supply chain um, that you like this shipping play, or is there another reason you like this right now? I got to know the thesis. Um, okay, he, he posted it. A huge uh, dividend day for Zim tomorrow, special dividend. I don't know. I just don't know how big of a catalyst that'll be for for this. Shelly, where'd Spencer go? Spencer left me. Look at this. I'm just all up here alone right now. All up here alone. Whoa. Why is it doing that? Like, are you hitting it a bunch? Yeah, I was hitting it a bunch. Oh, okay. There we go. Um... All right, Zim shipping. I, I don't know about this. I don't. I don't know if the dividend dates enough to to push it. Uh, Hurt Scrambler is asking. He's asking EZ if he's looking for a rally into the close. I think we could. Who, who knows? I think uh, right now a lot of people are just chilling out on the sideline, kind of selling stuff, going a lot of cash into the FOMC meeting tomorrow. So we'll see. But a lot of eyes are on financials right now. So we're talking Goldman Sachs. We're looking at J.P. Morgan, um, because these are companies that will actually benefit. Uh, from from a raise of rates, so a lot of, of interest in these financial names today. Definitely, financials probably the only sector that I've seen in the green today. Let I me mean, let's check in on uh, like an Exxon Mobil. Yeah, it looks like uh, some oil is doing well today too. Uh, PTN. Wow, Jim, the PE is one point six nine on uh, uh on Zim. Let me see if that's right. Overview. Yeah. Wow. That PE is crazy low. Something's got to be up there, right? I'll have to, Jim, I'll have to take some more, uh, do some more research onto, into Zim after this show and, and see kind of what I can find on it. But um, chart doesn't look great to me because you can see 
Uh, we, we've had a few red candles in a row. If we get back down to this previous support level of 42, I'd be interested if we can catch any support there, if we'll continue to drop um, down further than that. Uh, although it looks like right now we could also be, there's another support level. I don't know. There is a previous resistance level that could act as support. Um, oh, it's an IPO from the spring. All right, Jim. Uh, email us shows at Benzinga if you have any, you know, more insight on the stock. Other than that, I'm just going to do some looking into. But it is 2 o'clock. We've got the roadmap coming up. They're talking about Board Ape Yacht Club, one of the coolest projects in the NFT space right now. So uh, do not go anywhere. This stream will automatically redirect you to the roadmap. Um, hang out with the guys. Chris Kaji, Maz, Board Ape Yacht Club. Can't ask for a much better show than that. With that... We're wrapping up in Zynga Live. We will be back tomorrow at around 11.30 a.m. noon Eastern. I don't know, whatever time Spencer wants to show, start the show tomorrow. Hope everyone has a great rest of your Tuesday, and we will have a very interesting day tomorrow, to say the least. Peace and love, y'all. This is